Hello, and welcome to QuantPy. In this video, we are going to explain, both mathematically, and visually, the concepts of total and quadratic variations of the Brownian motion. As the concept of variation is, commonly, not covered in calculus courses, we are going to provide some, background information first. We will start with an informal account of, what is meant by, the variation of a function. We then, give the mathematical definition of different types of variations, and mention some generalization. We then focus on the total, and quadratic variations, and show, mathematically, and then visually, their calculations for a few simple, deterministic functions. We then derive, formula for, the quadratic variation of, the Brownian motion paths, showing that the formula holds pathwise. Roughly speaking, the variation of a function means, the activeness of the function. It just represents the total movements, or deviations, in the functions, over an interval. The mathematics might look a bit complicated for a minute or so, but it will become very obvious, very soon, once you have seen it in action. Let f be a function of x, and let the domain of the function be the interval from 0 to b. Let's divide the interval from 0 to b into n subintervals, which we assume to be of equal length for convenience. So the length of each subinterval is the interval from 0 to b divided by n. Let's k be the index of the subintervals. A generic interval can be represented as follows. Let's enumerate a few intervals to make it real. We can easily verify that the length of each subinterval is indeed b over n. We will use the definition of function and the subintervals to introduce the concept of variation. Mathematically, one can define the total variation of the function as the sum of its movements over very small subintervals. Notice that, as n tends to infinity, the length of each subinterval becomes very small. So we are capturing all movements that the function possesses. The absolute value is used so that both positive and negative movements are captured. Going down and going up both count as activity. You can easily see that a function that is varying too much will have higher variation whilst a function that is horizontal line is essentially asleep or inactive and hence will not have any variation. The concept of variation can be generalized. One can square the absolute value to get quadratic or second variation. And one can use p power of the deviations to get p variation. One can then generalize further as square and p power are essentially functions. Why stop there? One can use some other increasing functions of the deviation and call it phi variation. Note, the unit of p variation as defined above is p power of the unit of the deviation, so you will frequently see that the p variation is defined as the pth root of the above. But we will not worry about this. We will only focus on the first and second variations as we can go a long way with just these two concepts. The variation, of course, depends on the partitions that one chooses. If one chooses a different partition, then it is possible that the variation value would be different. The analysis guys will tell you that you should calculate the variation over all possible partitions and then take the maximum of these as the variation. They will even ask to generalize the maximum to supremum to make it even more abstract or general. We will construct the partitions in a different way. We will start with a given interval, then divide it into two, then divide each subinterval into two and continue until the partition has become very dense. The length of each subinterval will become very small, and the total number of intervals will become very large. In the limit, our variation will converge to some value, which we will call the variation. Essentially, we are changing the number of subintervals from n to a variable 2 to the power n, letting n tends to infinity, then give us the limiting value. Our sample interval will now look like this and has a length of b over. 2 to the power, n. Let's enumerate, a few intervals, to see how the subintervals, under the new scheme will look like. 
Of course, the number of steps required for convergence will depend on the function. If the function is monotonic, then one can get the variation with just one interval. If the function moves up and down a lot, then the number of intervals will need to be very large for the calculated value to converge. We will illustrate with a few simple examples. We will calculate the total variation and quadratic variation of these functions over the interval from 0 to 2. We will first give a mathematical derivation and then illustrate the limiting behavior visually. Let's start with the simplest of these, f of x equal x, the familiar 45 degree line, but with domain restricted from 0 to 2. Let's reproduce the total variation formula. B is the length of the interval, which is 2, in this example. Replacing the f of x with x, because our function value is equal to x, by definition, we get. Now, the length of each subinterval is b over 2 to the power n, so we get. We ignore the absolute value, because the length is positive, by construction. Summing a constant, 2 to the power, n times, means we multiply it by 2, to the power, n, so we get, where, b, is equal to 2. Now, let's calculate the quadratic variation. Plugging in the length of the interval, for the deviation, we get. Applying the sum of constant rule, we get. And simplifying, we get. Now, as n, tends to infinity, the denominator becomes very large, meaning the quadratic variation is, zero. We will now illustrate the calculation of the total and quadratic variation of this function visually. We draw the function over the given interval. We then measure the distance between the start and end values of the function. Notice the total variation is 2, as expected. We then divide the interval into two subintervals and measure the deviations in each subinterval. The sum of the absolute values of these deviations is the total variation and the sum of their squares is the quadratic variation. We then let n becomes large, meaning we increase the number of subintervals. As this function is monotonically increasing, the total variation is not affected as we increase the number of subintervals, however, the quadratic variation decreases until it becomes zero. To calculate the total variation of the other two functions, it is helpful to derive an alternative formula for the total variation. Let's reproduce the formula. We can use the mean value theorem to write it in terms of the derivative of the function. Where we use k prime for the point where the tangent becomes parallel to the line through the two points. Now the length of the interval is positive, so we can take it out of the absolute value. Now, we know that the limiting sum is, essentially, how the calculus guys introduce integration, so we write it as follows. Let's use this to calculate the total variation of x square. We know its derivative is 2 times x, integrating its derivative from 0 to 2. Substituting the derivative, noting that x is positive over the interval, we get. Evaluating the integral, we get. So, the total variation is, 4. Now for the quadratic variation, we repeat the same procedure, but we square the deviations. Applying the mean value theorem, separating the two terms, we get. Now, we know the length of each interval is, b, over 2, to the power, n, so we get. Writing this as, an integral, and taking the constant out, we get. Now, n is supposed to be large, so the quadratic variation is, 0. We will now, illustrate the calculation, of the total and quadratic variation of this function, visually. As in the previous example, we measure the distance between, the start and, end values, of the function. The total variation is 4, as expected. We then, divide the interval into two subintervals and measure the deviations in each subinterval. We then keep splitting each subinterval until the partition becomes very dense.
as this function is also monotonically increasing, the total variation is not affected as we increase the number of subintervals. However, the quadratic variation decreases until it becomes zero. Let's move to the third function now. To find its total variation, we first calculate its derivative. We then integrate over the given interval. Now, unlike the other two functions, this function is not monotonic, meaning the derivative changes sign. We will need to be careful about the absolute value. The derivative is 0 at x equal 5 over 6 and is negative to the left and positive to the right of this value of x, as one can easily see from the graph of the function. So to get rid of the absolute value, we divide the interval into two halves. We then multiply the integral over the lower interval by minus 1 to make it positive. You can easily verify that the sum of these two come out to be 37 over 6. And we know from before that the quadratic variation is 0. Let's see how it looks like visually. More interesting certainly and will ease our transition into the Brownian motion. It is time we applied our knowledge to the Brownian motion. We saw in the previous video that the Brownian motion trajectories are not differentiable. So if we were to apply our procedure to calculate its total variation, we will get infinity. Its total variation is indeed infinity. We will calculate its quadratic variation first. We will show that it has finite quadratic variation. One can then use this result to infer that its total variation must be infinity. If it were finite, then by increasing the number of intervals, one would get zero quadratic variation. So let's derive its quadratic variation. Our function is now Brownian motion over time interval from 0 to t. Let's reproduce the quadratic variation formula in terms of b. Let's denote the increment over each interval by delta b. So the quadratic variation formula becomes we are now going to show that as n becomes large, the quadratic variation over the entire interval becomes equal to the length of the interval. Or, moving t to the left-hand side, we get. Let's represent the expression inside the limit by s. So we need to show that s becomes zero, almost surely, as n becomes large. To prove this, we will use Chebyshev's inequality. The name sounds complicated, but all it says is that the proportion of values of a random variables that have a distance of more than epsilon from the mean is less than or equal to the variance divided by the square of the epsilon. This will help us establish that the probability that s deviates too much from zero can be made as small as one like by increasing n and the borel cantelli lemma will then help us translate this into almost sure convergence. Now, to apply Chebyshev's inequality, we need to find the mean and variance of s as s is the sum of the square of Brownian increments. It would be helpful to recall the formulae for the moments of the Brownian motion from a previous video. Recall that the second moment of Brownian movement over a given interval is the length of the interval. Our interval is defined as follows. So its expected value is the difference between the time indices which is t over 2 to the power n. And recall that the fourth moment of the Brownian increments is 3 times the square of the interval. So for our definition of increments, this becomes. Now, let's calculate the mean and variance of s taking expectation of both sides. Interchanging sum and expectation Substituting the expression for the second moment and applying the sum of constant rule, we get. So the expected value is 0. Now, let's calculate the variance. As the Brownian increments are independent, we can exchange the variance and sum to get. Applying the variance formula, 
to the square of the increment, we get. Substituting the moments and simplifying, we get. Now, let's summarize the key formulae. We wanted to prove that the quadratic variation of the Brownian over the interval from 0 to t is t by introducing a new variable s. We showed that the preceding statement is equivalent to requiring that the limit of s goes to 0. We also calculated the mean and variance of s. We are ready to apply the Chebyshev's inequality. Plugging in the mean and variance, we get. Now, as n becomes large, the right-hand side's approach is 0. All it is saying is that, given a value of epsilon, no matter how small, we can always make n large, so that the probability that the variable s differ from 0 by more than epsilon approaches 0. And we know s equals 0 means quadratic variation equals t. And for the more geeky ones amongst us, we can now recast this in terms of borel cantelli lemma. To say that, S approaches zero almost surely. We will, now, show visually, the calculation of the total and quadratic variations of the Brownian motion over the interval from zero to two. For a given sample path, we first divide the interval into two halves. We measure the deviation in each subinterval. The sum of the positive values of these deviations is the total variation and the sum of the squares of the deviations is the quadratic variation. We will then double the frequency or as the visual guys would put it, the frame rate and perform the same calculations. As you can see, the total variation increases and the quadratic variation approaches too as we increase the number of subintervals. This is only about 2000 intervals. And as you make the partition more dense, the total variation will become very large. We hope you enjoyed the video and we look forward to seeing you in the next in which we are going to investigate the definitions of stochastic integral and stochastic differential.